Coming up, traditional gender roles in Native American cultures have included two-spirit people in a significant way. An Oglala Lakota poetry program gives voice to youth and crisis averted. Federal officials have passed legislation on the debt ceiling, but what's in it for Native communities? I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in the Southwest, where a sacred site has received new federal protections. Last week, Interior Secretary Deb Holland issued an order that will block new oil and gas leases surrounding Chaco Canyon. The area has a deep cultural connection to Pueblos and other tribal nations. The order, which was part of a lengthy decision-making process, applies to federal lands within a 10-mile radius of Chaco and will last for the next 20 years. The withdrawal will not affect existing leases. Holland, who championed legislation on Chaco as a member of Congress, says efforts to protect the landscape have been going on for decades. In a statement, officials from the Navajo Nation said the action jeopardizes future economic opportunities for their people. This withdrawal comes nearly two years after President Biden promised to take action on the site in 2021. In Minnesota, new steps are being taken to return to native land the site of the 1862 Dakota War Battles. The Minnesota legislature last month approved bills that paved the way for transferring a 1,400-acre state park to the Upper Sioux community. The next step calls for state officials to identify any impediments to the transfer and report back to the legislature in January. Chairman Kevin Jenswold says he has been asking for this land to be returned 18 years ago. Federal law requires the state to purchase land to create a similar sized park in order to replace the Upper Sioux Agency State Park when it is returned to indigenous lands. An indigenous university in Lawrence, Kansas has a new leader. Yankton Sioux Tribe citizen Francis Arpan will serve as the new president of Haskell Indian Nations University. The school was founded in 1884 and is a national leader in Native education, research, and cultural preservation. Current semester enrollment averages at nearly 1,000 students, representing 140 federally recognized tribal nations. Arpan, whose success spans five colleges, says he wants to create a student-centered place with more pathways to succeed. Bureau of Indian Education Director Tony Dearman says RPAN's positive record will help lift the quality of higher education. There is new funding aimed at housing for Native Americans. In late May, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development awarded $95 million for affordable housing and community development activities. Fifty-five communities were selected for the grants as part of the Indian Community Development Block Grant Program. That includes in the states of Alaska, California, Oklahoma, Montana, and New Mexico. It provides housing rehabilitation, roads, sewer and water facilities, and community buildings for reservation and indigenous communities. HUD Secretary Marsha Fudge said the funding will allow tribal citizens to meet their own unique needs and make tribal communities safer and healthier. Moving to sports, it is now guaranteed that an indigenous player will win the National Hockey League championship. 
The Las Vegas Golden Knights and the Florida Panthers faced off in Nevada for Game 2 of the Stanley Cup Finals last night. Mohawk citizen Brandon Montour and Sioux Valley Dakota Nation citizen Zach Whitecloud have been standout defensive players for their respective teams throughout the playoffs. One of them will be the first Indigenous player to write their names on the Cup since Ojibwe star TJ Oshie in 2018. As part of the tradition, each player on the winning team takes the trophy home for a day, so it's safe to say the Stanley Cup will visit a First Nation this summer. The only question is, will it be going to the Six Nations of the Grand River in Ontario or the Sioux Valley Dakota Nation in Manitoba? Right now, the series stands with the Knights leading 2 to nothing. Game 3 of the finals between the Knights and the Panthers is on Thursday in Miami, Florida. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. President Joe Biden signed historic legislation on Saturday night, raising the debt limit and avoiding an economic disaster. It marked a rare moment when Democrats and Republicans voted on the same bill. ICT editor-at-large Mark Trahant is here with us now to talk about the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Hi there, Mark. Hi, Aaliyah. Set the backdrop for us in terms of how we got to this point to begin with and why lawmakers were moving so quickly. So the United States has this really crazy policy. It's imagine having a credit card and you get to set your own limit. And the limit's $10,000 and you spent 11,000. And you think, wow, I gotta set a new limit. That's what they did. I mean, we spend more than we earn uh, in taxes. And so every few years, the Congress has to come up and raise the limit, which is artificial. Um, what makes this so troubling in so many ways is that so much of the United States spending is on automatic pilot. Uh, the big bulk part of the budget is Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and that is automatic. No matter what happens, the money is spent. So we end up fighting over a really small portion of the budget, about less than a third, and that's where almost all the federal Indian programs are in that one third. What, what was remarkable about this deal last week was that it really created a centrist coalition where uh, more Democrats and Republicans voted for the bill, and uh, it really brought together uh, a lot of elements all at once. We know that the Fiscal Responsibility Act is 99 pages long. What exactly are the high points for Indian country? Some really key points. One is um, the law requires that agencies set, send back uh, unobligated funds. Right now we're trying to determine how much of that is at the Indian Health Service and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There was a hearing in the Senate uh, recently and Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska really pressed the IHS director on how much unobligated funds are, are available. It could be as much as $9 billion, but uh, at least $2 billion on um, direct and $4 billion on discretionary. And tell us how long this legislation is set to last. Well, the legislation will um, go for two years until the next debt limit comes up. Um, I mean, other countries would probably say this is nonsense and just not have, I mean, we're really one of the very few countries in the world that do it this way and just spend the money and then figure out how to pay for it. Uh, some of the factors that will, um, I think what's really important for people to know is that the fight that took place over the debt limit is not over. It's now gonna spill into the farm bill, it's gonna spill into appropriations, and the winners and losers are all gonna say, this is our chance to get it next time, and it's actually gonna get more intense as we go forward. That's a great segue into my next question, which is how much uh, the debt limit conversation will play into the 2024 election. There are really two distinct governing philosophies, and they both have very passionate views of that. One view is that low taxes and low spending should be the priority. The other is that it's okay to have taxes and spend money on programs. Within that, there's a second debate that's probably even more important on the role of climate change and whether fossil fuels should be protected or it's funny having to have a, a bake sale for Exxon. Um, the idea of fossil fuels being protected versus uh, really investing in a new green economy. And those two different philosophies are practically irreconcilable. So as we go forward, that debate will only get more intense. And what's really interesting to me is the timing. President Joe Biden, of course, has announced he's running for re-election. Um, and so this could be something that pops up 
pretty close after the election. Absolutely, and um, you're gonna see it play out in so many little places because uh, every Senate race, every House race will have a version of this uh, debate on how far to go with federal spending. And really, I mean, that's one of the things both sides are missing, is that in addition to the debates about how we spend money on government, there is a long-term debate that we have to have on sustainability, and that is because so much of the budget is directed at older people like me. And um, as the population ages, that continues to cost more money. As I was looking what is inside the Fiscal Responsibility Act, one of the bullet points that stuck out to me was the new uh, requirements for those who receive food assistance. That seems as though it's something that could affect Native communities pretty hard. The work requirements for both food SNAP, which is the old food stamps program, and TANF, which is welfare, are significant, and how those are implemented will be a big question for Indian country. I mean, one of the things there is they said, well, people should have a work requirement, but what if there are no jobs? And that becomes problematic then. Do you want to do it by volunteer work? How do you count for it? Who's going to be the uh, person keeping track of all of that? There's a lot of questions remaining. The other question and the other topic that lawmakers wrestled over was student loan payments. Yeah. Um, Th that, that is unresolved at present because there's a temporary pause and people will have to start paying some. But the long-term um, resolution was not in the bill, so there will be continued fight over that. And um, so much of that, again, fix, fi factors in with demographics in that people borrowed money uh, at a time when they didn't think they would have to pay it back at the same rates they were. And it, it's a big share of the income. In the introduction, I mentioned that this is the first time that Democrats and Republicans have voted together, bipartisan, showing their bipartisanship on a bill like this. Maybe talk about how long it's been since we've seen something like that. It's, well, and I think really it's been a long time in Congress, but where to look for this is the states, and it happens all the time in state governments. So there is a process for this in place where a centrist coalition can kind of take over. The question is how long will it last and will they be able to get other things done? The one thing to watch really closely is the farm bill because so many people have interests in the farm bill that aren't partisan and you look at farmers and how they wanna do things. Uh, one of the fights already surfacing on the farm bill that's gonna be interesting is should climate change be a factor in farming policies? And uh, you're seeing a lot of partisanship on that particular question. And just so our viewers can uh, look forward to the farm bill, tell us where it currently stands and uh, when there could potentially be action on it. Well, well, it has to be done by the end of this Congress and um, it's in committee form right now and they're debating different parts of it and uh, it's a process. <laughs> Mark Jayant, thank you so much. Thank you, Leah, always good to be here. Community was front and center at the grand opening of the Oglala Lakota Art Space in late May. Pate Sanwi is part of the poetry program called Dances with Words. ICT Shirley Snavy has this interview. This grand opening means that a lot more youth are able to have accessibility to art and being able to create their their themselves, be able to creatively express themselves, be able to creatively explore their culture, be able to make new friends, make more connections with other artists, being able to hopefully see this space as a safe space and to be able to come here and want to create art and you know make community with one another and fellow artists. Pate Sawi performed at We the Peoples Before, a Kennedy Center event sponsored by First Peoples Fund. The land remembers low rumbling, the ground crumbling, bleach, yaya, relatives stumbling, children's laughter converts unwillingly to screams. The iron horse transferring a gas takujas to concentration camps. You called residential schools, watching as they freeze, attempting to return home. I was going through a lot before I became a Dances with Words poet, and I found poetry through a program at Recloud, and that program kind of dwindled into, or kind of ex expanded into what it is today. And because of that, I stayed with poetry. I felt safe in the group. I felt like I was heard. 
and I felt like I had a purpose to be here. So the group definitely had helped me feel less alone. It made me feel like I had a place and I had a purpose and I had people in my life that actually cared about me. Because before that, I was also attempting and doing what I could to try and survive in this time. And the program Dances with Words and then First People's Funds and Lori Puyer, they all were there to help me. And I wouldn't be here without the Dances with Words program. I don't, I tell my family this because I'm like, you know, if grandpa didn't take me to the workshops, if he didn't take me to the open mics, if he didn't take me to poetry slams, I wouldn't be here because poetry definitely helped me talk about what was hard not to say. And I, because of my experience and because of how I felt and dealt with what I was going through, I want our youth to have that too. And being a mentor, being a youth, youth development coordinator, being a part of this space means I'm able to give that to youth. And because I was in their position, I know what it's like to not be heard. I know what it's like to feel like the only, the only resort is suicide. I know what that's like. And I also know what it's like to not have anyone to be there, not have outlets, not have resources. So I want to be that person. And I feel like I am because of all these youth that have joined, showed like themselves. And I've seen youth open up slowly. They came into the program a little shy, quiet, but then they, they got so much more comfortable that now when we see each other, they smile and say, hi, how are you? And give each other a hug. And they're, they're so happy to be able to be a part of the space. And just knowing that I'm able to help them in that way, just knowing that I'm a part of the impact, the positive impact of being able to help our youth feel that safety and closure that, you know, our people are more than just hurt. Our people are creative, our people are beautiful, our people are so compassionate and passionate as well that, you know, I'm so happy that OLA exists so that hopefully we're able to kind of break that stereotype that, you know, natives just kill themselves. Because I don't want that. I don't want that stereotype. I want people to, to see us and know, yeah, those people, those natives, they're creative. They're beautiful, creative, artistic individuals. They're innovators. They're able to, you know, I don't want to say resilient because it's used too much, but you know, we're able to come up from the ashes <laughs> and just help one another. And that's where it starts is the community. In Lakota, Pate Sawi means white buffalo calf woman. They are redefining what traditional culture means today. If you have tattoos, if you have piercings, if you have dyed hair, you're not going to be welcomed into the spirit world. And I told him I didn't like that. I didn't believe in that traditional way of thinking. And he said that that's okay, that you're, if you're free to believe that. And I said that I just personally don't see that our, our, our ancestors, our relatives in the spirit world, I don't think that they would judge us like that. I think that they would see us as we're evolving. We're just adapting to what this time and age is. And part of adapting is, you know, doing what you can. If it's modifying your body and how you look, then that's fine. And, you know, our culture had two spirits and they definitely never got judged. They were seen as sacred. And I know that if our ancestors were here now, they would see us all as sacred because we're still here. June is Pride Month in the U.S., and our next guest is here to put this into historical context. The Reverend Martin Brokenleg holds a doctorate degree in psychology and is a graduate of the Episcopal Divinity School. He has a history of teaching and retired as the Director of Indigenous Ministries at the University of British Columbia. Now he is a priest with the Anglican Church of Canada. Father Brokenleg, hello to you. Hello. Thank you for having me. 
you've studied the historical context of two-spirit people. Tell us about what your research shows. Well, uh, my approach to Native American studies, which I taught for about 35 years, was of course in part academic, but it was in part personal. Uh, my home is the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. I'm from the Lakota Nation. And of course, growing up in that world, a person just hears teachings and experiences related by elders. And I remember many years ago, when I was probably middle school or high school age, I remember hearing an elder say that for a community to be healthy, there had to be seven kinds of people uh, that were in that community. There had to be men who healed with, with, um, with medicines, uh, with er herbalists, I guess you could say male herbalists, female herbalists, men who healed with ceremony, women who healed with ceremony. There needed to be leaders, we would say Itansha in the Lakota. Then there needed to be the Nacha. These were the people who took over whenever there was serious need, like a battle or something like that. And then he said there also need to be the Wii Inkte, the two-spirit people. All of these people had to be active for the community to be whole. So I heard that experientially, learned that experientially from growing up in the community. Then, of course, as I read, I, what I encountered a great deal was the confusion and bewilderment and hostility of European peoples when they encountered two-spirit people. Because uh, if we look historically across both North and South America and across the Pacific, two-spirit people are welcomed and are and open and very much a part of traditional societies. If you go to New Zealand or Australia or Hawaii or Latin America or here in, in Turtle, Turtle Island of North America, uh, what we tend to see is an open, welcoming quality of two-spirit people. And as you say accurately, all communities regarded two-spirit people as having a special closeness to the spirit world. And so that meant that there were, that two-spirit people needed to be knowledgeable in ceremonies uh, but also needed, uh, were also called on whenever spiritual power was in need. So, for example, uh, naming ceremonies among us Lakota, you usually ask an honored person to bestow a name on a younger member of the family, or if something significant happens to a person as an adult, then a new name would be given to that person. Uh, and there, is, there were certain esteemed people in any community who would be asked to do that. Over one's lifespan, a man might be invited to, to name two or three people, but a two-spirit person might be dozens and dozens and dozens. That's the case with me. Uh, I have named probably 40 uh, people uh, because I'm known as a two-spirit person and the names that are that I pray for are considered somehow more powerful, I guess, than the names of, of other people. So, so you're right in saying, yeah, this is a long open tradition in indigenous communities in North America, and it bewildered the Europeans. Are you aware of any indigenous nations who um, shunned or um, looked down upon two-spirit people? That we see that only after the presence of missionaries and European explorers. This is their mentality. And of course, there was great hostility to two-spirit peoples across Europe and across some parts of Asia. Uh, but not in North America. I, I have never heard of a single indigenous community to North America that was that was hostile or rejecting. And of course, in Lakota communities, we tease everybody about everything. So a two-spirit person is going to be teased uh, from time to time about this or that. Um, in my in my community, the Lakota community, we had our three genders were traditional men, traditional women, and then the wink day is the current word that we use. It's a nonsensical word in a way, because it means kills woman. And why we would call a man a kills woman uh, doesn't make any sense if they're two spirit. A linguistic family on my reservation of Rosebud said that wasn't the original pronunciation of the word. The original word was we e ink day, a multisyllable word, we e ink day. And it referred to, in the Lakota language, we have a form of the language that men speak and a form of the language that women speak. The two-spirit people could use either one, and that's what that the original name word would have meant. We e ink day means the men who could use the women's language or the men's language. Uh, so we so but of course our ears have gotten accustomed to hearing English, so there are sounds in Lakota language that people don't hear anymore, and one is the multisyllable we e ink day four-syllable word been reduced to two of wink day. 
Father, we only have about a minute left here, but I am curious, you've said the word to spirit many times now. It seems as though from my observation that that's something that a lot of indigenous people have really come to um, use regularly when speaking about the LGBTQ community. Can you maybe comment on if that's okay to use widely? I think, it is, I think it's an, uh, an appropriate term to use, it's respectful and in fact was originated by Two-Spirit people. Sometime in the 1960s, there was an organization of Two-Spirit people in the San Francisco area, as I understand it, who started to use that term, but one of their recommendations was never to translate it into an indigenous language because it, would, it, it might be offensive in, the, in those various languages. Uh, so, Awoni uh, Anumpa would not be a term. Two-Spirit in Lakota language is not a term we would use we would use the English word two spirit because it carries the notion, the indigenous notion that everything is spiritual. When you come right down to it, everything is spiritual. And so a person who has both feminine and masculine spirits within is a person whose behavior and lifestyle is going to be different from a person who has just one, a male spirit or a female spirit. So it, it is a respectful term to use and I appreciate you using it. Well, Father Martin Broken Lake, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.